Geology of Osterfield Universität, Denmark, 2013. Earned a master's at Boise uh, State University and returned there for her postdoc before moving to Salt Lake City. Her research focuses on geochronology and geochemistry, with particular interest in large volume high silica rhyolites. Think of Yellowstone. Um, she has previously worked uh, on an oil and gas drilling rig, good for you, uh, as a national park ranger, including Craters of the Moon and Zion, and on geoinform geoinformatics databases. And when not indulging, she says, in rocks and volcanoes, Tiffany spends time getting to know Utah, exploring the desert, and traveling to foreign lands. So without further ado, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Tiffany Rivera. tonight and for being so enthusiastic about geology. Um, I am excited to be here to talk with you about Yellowstone's eruptions um, and mostly tonight what I will talk about are some of the smaller eruptions that uh, are often neglected when we think about volcanism at Yellowstone. Um, so this is one of our field sites and I'll come back to this slide uh, a little later. Um, this is here we go. This is my uh, one of my students um, Ryan Furlong who is out sampling um, in the field out here. This is our, our trusty field vehicle, uh, thanks to Enterprise um, for providing sturdy cars that'll get us to some of these locations. Um, and this is uh, the Blue Creek Flow, uh, which is out in eastern Idaho, um, right around the edge of the shared caldera rim between the Henry Fork and the Island Park caldera. And so I'll come back to this slide in just a couple minutes. Um, but one of these flows, um, I guess why I wanted to start with this was to show you that these flows aren't always as pretty or as um, as uh, uh, kind of in your face as some of the super eruptions that you are maybe familiar with here in Jackson and in Yellowstone. Um, and so they're a little nondescript. They're often very vegetated. Um, they're often very weathered, and they are pretty ugly rocks in some cases. Um, and I have some of those with me. Um, and so they make them a little bit difficult to work with. Um, and so what we are doing is trying to get the eruptive history of these rocks and put them in relation to the super eruptions of Yellowstone. Okay, I'm going to try our button here. Okay, so first, if I'm going to talk about the not so super eruptions, um, we need to get an idea of what is a super eruption. And so super eruptions are generally considered large volume eruptions, and somebody has placed a, um, a volume on it, about 300 cubic kilometers of material. Our friend, um, the Mesa Falls Tuff, which is the second super eruption of the Yellowstone sequence, um, does not qualify. It is only 280, only 280 cubic kilometers. Um, so there are large volume eruptions. This is uh, this diagram up here is Toba. This is the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff um, that I will talk about today. Um, the Lava Creek Tuff, um, which is the youngest, uh, so uh, Huckleberry and then Lava Creek, which is, it comes from the youngest um, caldera of Yellowstone. So we're thinking about really large volume things. They're dominantly silicic systems. So they're high silica rhyolites. They have um, high uh, weight percent of SiO2 in them. Um, and that makes them very explosive as well. So they're dominantly silicic systems, so you're not going to find a whole lot of um, super eruptions made from basalt. Okay? Um, it's a different type of volcanic province. And then they produce some widespread ash deposits. Uh, some of the um, ashes from Yellowstone can be found as far away as the Gulf of Mexico. And some of the older eruptions from the Yellowstone uh, kind of hotspot track have um, have deposited ash in eastern Kansas, or sorry, Nebraska, um, at Asheville State Park, which is this poor guy here, um, was buried in 16 or I think actually about 12 million year old Yellowstone type ashes um, and, and buried in that ash. And finally, these super eruptions can often have global consequences. In the case of the Toba eruption from about 74,000 or seven. 74,000 years ago, um, there was likely to be um, a little bottleneck in genetic diversity in Southeast Asia as well. Um, some of this ash can be put up into the stratosphere. It can cause uh, climate change. Um, and of course, here in North America, 
Um, if Yellowstone was to erupt violently again, a lot of that ash be, would be deposited over the central part of the U.S., where much of our crops come from. So that could have some different types of consequences that we might not often think about when we think about Yellowstone erupting. Okay, and I have a couple of maps here. So this is the uh, map of the Yellowstone hotspot track. Um, so the Yellowstone hotspot started about 17 million years ago, um, kind of in the tri-state area down here uh, where uh, Nevada, Oregon, and Idaho come together. And as the North American plate has moved over geologic time, um, that hotspot has stayed stationary and has blasted these calderas out over southeastern Idaho, southern Idaho, um, until its present day location up here at Yellowstone National Park. And again, another map showing the distribution of some of these super eruption ashes. Um, here, as I mentioned, some of the ashes can be found out in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, somebody asked if I'd be talking about Bishop Tuff. And so here is the one mission or mention for the Bishop Tuff from um, Long Valley Caldera in uh, California. Uh, but you can see that most of the Yellowstone ashes um, generally cover North America. Okay? And so this is why they get so much attention. But alas, we don't really think about these smaller eruptions, okay? So let me go through our kind of our cycle at Yellowstone, where we think about three different super eruption cycles, okay? Um, Bob Christensen in the early 1980s um, really recognized this with his work out here in Yellowstone, and he was the one that really set the stage for um, the, the cyclicity of the Yellowstone super eruptions. So the first cycle um, was the largest of the three. It erupted about two million years ago and produced the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. I have some of that with me. Um, the second one is the Mesa Falls Tuff, um, about 1.3 million years. Um, and this is the smallest of the three. And then the most recent one is the Lava Creek Tuff, at about 0.64 million. And this is the one from the most recent caldera at Yellowstone. So another map here of Yellowstone to show you where those calderas are. Um, so the first caldera is often uh, referred to as the largest one. Sometimes you'll hear it uh, described as the Island Park caldera. The second is the smallest out here um, in the Henry's Fork area, um, Ashton Island Park. And then the third one being the Lava Creek out through here. And so you can see that the size of these calderas also varies. Um, and where, where I'm going to talk about today is right along this kind of shared rim of um, the first and second caldera. So right along here is where we're doing a lot of our work. Okay. So back to our, our cycles, what, um, we can think about these, these super eruptions, but these super eruptions are often preceded by and followed by some smaller eruptions. Okay, so some not so super eruptions. So in this case, we have sub eruptions, right? Before and after that first cycle. And then there's going to be a gap in time before new eruptions start before the Mesa Falls, okay? Then we make our next caldera, and then we erupt some more material after that. And then some more time passes, and we erupt some more material before we form our third big caldera. And you probably know some of these eruptions, okay? The youngest one that we see in Yellowstone is this guy right here, and it is the Pitchstone Plateau rhyolite, and it is 74,000 years old, okay? Geologically, that's really young, okay? Um, and when, especially when thinking about millions of years for these calderas to form. The last eruption that we had in Yellowstone was only 74,000 years ago. And a whole bunch of these other flows that you see around here, this is um, Mallard Lake, Old Faithful sits right about here. Mallard Lake is also <coughs> one of those young, not so super eruptions. Um, it's a little dome, so as you're watching Old Faithful go off, there's a hill behind it. That's one of those domes, those not so super eruptions. Another one that you might be familiar with is Obsidian Cliff, okay? Again, another not so super eruption but obviously it produced some sort of volcanic activity that we need to be able to understand if we want to have a better control on the geology of the region, okay, and the geologic history, and for also predicting some of these future eruptions. Okay, 
So again, here we are back at uh, the Blue Creek Flow. Okay? It looks nothing like the beautiful Obsidian Cliff. It looks nothing like the Pitchstone Plateau. And it is a very nondescript flow. Okay? And this is probably why they've been um, maybe neglected throughout their research, is because uh, they're not pretty rocks. They're much older. They're not part of like the recent activity. They're not helping to build up our knowledge about the, the present Yellowstone caldera. Um, and so I took this as an opportunity to really dive into what is the eruptive stratigraphy out here in eastern Idaho. Okay, so again, I'm going to focus today on figuring out the sequence of <coughs> pre and post eruptions okay, between the first and second cycles. So I'm going to let some other experts take care of Pitchstone Plateau and Obsidian Cliff. We're going to go back in time just a little bit to think about what this what the cycle looks like before the present day cycle. Okay, because the understanding our history is going to help us understand our future. So when we zoom in just a little bit, first and second cycle, we have several mapped um, not so super eruptions. One of them precedes the first cycle. We only know of one lava that erupted before the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. It's called Snake River Butte. That's not to say that there weren't others. There might have been others, but what's happened to them? They've probably been blasted out by a subsequent caldera. Okay? So we only have the record of one volcano, one eruption before um, Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. And then in between these two, we have what's called the Big Bend Ridge Rhyolites. And they've, um, Bob Christensen and some others have mapped out five, maybe six different flows um, that occurred between these two super eruptions. Okay? So, this is what I'm going to talk about today. These five, six, seven or so units in relationship to the timing of those calderas. Okay. Well, let's start here. here. Here's what we know. We know the age of the Huckleberry Ridge Tuff. We have that down pretty good. We know the age of the Mesa Falls Tuff. We have that down pretty good. We're really good at studying the super eruptions. But then we have all of these other units in between them that their ages really overlap when you consider their uncertainty. So in this case, we have Bishop Mountain, Green Canyon, Tuff of Lyle Spring. Well, they're all 1.16. But if they came before the caldera, and the caldera is 1.3, well, that doesn't make sense, right? We're going to blast those things away. So what we wanted to do was try to resolve this stratigraphy. How did these things erupt? When did they erupt in relationship to the, those calderas? So you're going to see bits and pieces of this kind of time scale quite a lot um, uh, uh, throughout the next hour or so. Okay. So the big problem is we don't actually know how old these things are. They've got 60,000 years um, of uncertainty. Everything overlaps. We can't really figure out what came first, what came second. Okay. And so here's our, here's our big problem. Can we resolve this stratigraphy with respect to the caldera forming questions? Okay. All right. Why do we care? Right? Why do we care about this? It's not the active caldera. Well, the first thing that we can do is we can get the pace of the magnetism and the volcanism over the last two million years. We can figure out how fast these eruptions are occurring and figure out how much time it takes for us to build up enough magma to erupt. Okay? We can look at magma flux rates. How much magma are we inserting into the crust that erupts? And we also have a record of magma that doesn't erupt preserved in some of these rocks. Can we constrain the duration of these volcanic cycles? Are they actually cycles? Do we see cyclicity in these super eruptions? Is there some sort of cyclicity in the um, smaller eruptions relative to the bigger eruptions? So if we've got a 74,000 year old eruption at Pitchstone Plateau, does that help us understand when the next super eruption is coming? And then this one, this is a new idea for me, the proxy for continental growth. Um, is this process the same process that we saw in uh, the Precambrian when we were really starting to build continents? And so I hope that the, the work that I show you um, tonight on, on and it helps to answer that, these four questions. Okay. 
So let's go back to our map of Yellowstone and our calderas. Again, uh, we're going to be focused right out here along that shared rim of the first and second calderas. Okay, so now I'm going to zoom into that. This is a um, digital elevation model of the area. Um, in pink is our caldera rim <coughs> right through here. Um, I've also highlighted the town of Ashton, Upper Mesa Falls, up through here, Island Park Reservoir that you can see. Okay, So here's our caldera rim, and here's Snake River Butte, which is, again is that first um, eruption prior to caldera formation. And then uh, the rest of the Big Bend Ridge rhyolite up through here. And so these are the guys that we're really going to focus on are these four, five, six, um, maybe seven or so units. Well, here's our field exposure. Okay, and if you've ever been out and done field work, this is not a very good field exposure. Okay, so uh, it's very vegetated. Um, we are deep into moose country, deep into bear country. Uh, this is my colleague Mark Schmitz of Boise State. Um, the exposure is not good. Okay, so here is uh, Mark at one of our sites. Here is another one. Okay, you know, where's the rock? Here is the rock on this side. Right here is the rock on this Green Canyon flow. Um, again, not very good exposure. Um, this is headquarters flow. Okay, uh, getting a little bit better. You can see some outcrop sitting up here on this ridge right up through here. Uh, it, you know, again, we thank Enterprise for providing us vehicles that will take us clear on these dirt roads. Um, they're not paying me. They don't actually think they know where we take them. Uh, and then this is a view from the top of Snake River Butte. Um, this is my colleague Amanda Lobb um, looking uh, south from Snake River Butte. And so here you can see that we've got some nicer boulders that we can sample. Um, and we certainly can't complain about the views. And then we really luck out in some cases and get this guy. Um, this is the Tuff of Lyle Spring, and um, it, is, it is a very small um, outcrop um, way back on North Antelope Flat Road, if you get out that way. Um, and this is the only mapped exposure of it that we know. And, and this one's actually going to play a pretty important role in figuring out that stratigraphy of these um, eruptions. Uh, the Tuff of Lyle Spring, and I have some samples of this with me, uh, okay, looks like this. Um, this is uh, just a hand sample that, that we took at the time of collection. You can see some pumice class in here. Those pumices have been flattened from the uh, deposition of the tuff. Um, my student, Jamie Benson, um, was tasked with working on this unit and figuring out the age of it. And I said, well, if we want to know the age of the, uh, the eruption, we want to date the pumice. So I said, figure out how to extract the pumice out of this rock. And here she was with a little circular saw, her um, hammer trying to chisel away all of the matrix for these things. Well, we went back out in the field and she lucked out because we found one giant pumice. So she no longer had to solve rocks and uh, she got really bummed out about that. Um, but we found one of these giant pumices and we are now able to date the pumice and the matrix separately. Um, and that, again, is going to um, prove really important to figuring out the pace of pragmatism. Okay, field exposures. Uh, so thin sections, uh, these things are rhyolites, so they contain um, sanidine and quartz. They'll contain a little bit of plagioclase in them. Um, we've got uh, the very um, rare phthalite, uh, which is an olivine in some of these rocks. And a lot of the um, Big Bend Ridge rhyolites um, and in the top of Lyle Spring, we also pick up some biotite. And biotite is really rare in the entire Yellowstone volcanic field. Okay? So in some of the, the, um, the early work that was done, Bob Christensen saw the, uh, the biotite and was able to say, well, these things must have some shared source. Their chemistry is the same. Their mineralogy is the same. And it's different from what we see in the super eruptions. 
Okay, so what are we doing with these? Let me back up here for a second. So what are we going to do with these? Um, we are going to take the sanidine, okay, so grains like this, the feldspar sanidines, potassium feldspars, we're going to extract them from all of these rocks. We're going to, uh, to date the sanidine. Okay. It's a variation on potassium argon dating, uh, which was really um, kind of instrumental in getting us to date young volcanic rocks uh, back in the 60s, 50s, 60s. And then uh, we developed, uh, Mary Hugh and Turner developed the argon argon dating method, um, which is now what is used for dating these really young rocks. So we're going to extract the sanidine grains from all these rocks. We're going to irradiate them um, at a nuclear reactor and then uh, analyze how much argon gas is, is in these and then we can date the rocks that way. I brought with me um, a little vial of some of these sanidine grains too. Okay, so the goal is to use this high precision geochronology, this argon argon dating to um, resolve the eruptive stratigraphy. We do this because we know that potassium um, decays to argon through a no, with a known rate, and so we can measure how much argon gas is there in order to date the rock. Okay? Um, I use a lab at the uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison, um, my colleague Brian Jika, and I have been working on these things for several years. And we do two different kinds of experiments. Um, which I will talk about each of those as an example. Um, the first one is called a fusion experiment where you basically take a, a laser and shoot it at this one little grain okay, of sanity and it releases all of the gas when you measure that. The other kind of experiment that we do is a step heating or um, incremental heating experiment where you slowly increase your laser power um, and to release that gas over a longer period of time. Both of the methods are great um, and give us great results, which I will um, show you here in just a minute. And if you're into the tech side of it, um, we're using a new instruments, Nobles mass spectrometer with 5 ATP ion counters and a 60 watt CO2 laser. Um, so here's our machine, it looks like this. This is the magnet, this is the laser. Um, down here in your sample chamber, so laser shoots down through here, um, gets kind of cleaned up through the gas, and then it uh, goes into the magnet, um, separates it, and then we can measure how much argon is there. The bottom picture here um, is one of our uh, irradiation discs that you can see a whole bunch of little crystals in the center, and then you can see some green crystals around the side, and this is what we uh, do to send our um, samples to the reactor. We stack them up in a little glass tube. Okay, so I'm going to start you with um, an example of a step heating diagram. And uh, in this diagram, you can see all these little boxes. Each one of those boxes represents a, a time when we um, fired the laser at the grain and released a little bit of gas. And then we increased that laser power and then uh, released a little bit of gas. And then we increased it again with a little bit of gas. And so each one of these steps represents an increase in the laser power. And the goal of this exercise is to slowly release the gas over time and make sure that each little release of gas gives you the same age, right? It's a way basically to look for consistency throughout the grain. And so here, this is uh, one grain, one grain, okay, from Bishop Mountain Flow. And we can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps or so. All eight of those steps make a plateau. And what I mean by that is that the ages, the thickness of that box for the age, all overlap. Okay? I'll show you some where they don't overlap, which tells us that the grain was a little bit more complex. Okay, so this is one grain, and we get, you know, five, six, seven, eight ages, depending on how, um, how many steps we want to do. And so we'll do, you know, 10 grains or so like this because we want to make sure that we can repeat it from grain to grain to grain. So in the end, you get something that looks like this. And here we've got uh, the upper four or so all make plateaus. They're all sanidine grains. Um, you can see these little open boxes. This one does not right, align with these other boxes through here. Okay, I'm showing this one over here. This box does not align with this one, so it does not get included with the plateau. And we want to just make sure that all of the grains that we analyze give us the same age. 
same plateau age. And in the case of Bishop Mountain, uh, we've got four grains up here that give us the same age. This was a um, ground mass experiment, and here we have two grains that give us no plateau. Okay, There's, the grains were too complex for us to get a good age on them. So this is what step heating looks like. Um, this is what total fusion looks like. This, remember, is where we just fire the laser at it, release all the gas at once, and then analyze the age. So we just plot up those ages, kind of just rank on that oldest to youngest. And what we're looking for is a big peak. Okay, we want to say, let's analyze 10 grains or so, and then do we get, all get the same age? And if we get that same age, well, then that mean age is the age of the, the eruption. And so in this example, we've got uh, seven grains here that um, are all with an error, one grain that is not, okay? So seven grains over here that are with an error, one that is not with an error, so we throw it out, it's too old. And then in this experiment, okay, this one. This is uh, actually not from Yellowstone, but it's a really nice example to um, introduce you to some of the Yellowstone complexities, which um, is the Tuff of Lyle Spring, okay? And th these are our results for the Tuff of Lyle Spring. And you can see that there is a very um, kind of wide range in ages from about 1.45 all the way to 1.52, this guy up here, okay? Um, and we can see one big peak, but we also have some of these little peaks. So I'll talk about those here in just a couple minutes. But now we don't have a continuous population of grains. Instead, we can see multiple populations of ages within those grains. Okay, so back to our stratigraphy and trying to resolve this stratigraphy with our argon dating. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first cycle. And remember that the first cycle okay, is this stuff down here, Snake River Butte, Huckleberry, and then the two um, headquarters in Blue Creek. And these got lumped together based on uh, Bob Christensen's work um, with the chemistry of the rocks. So we're going to try to resolve out the Blue Creek stuff, 177181 were the pre-existing ages, okay, using the old dating method. Okay. Our new results up here show that those things erupted at 1.98 um, plus or minus just a few thousand years, okay, when headquarters about 1.95. So what we've done, let me back up here, is we have taken this new dating method, applied it to individual grains, extracted from these really poor looking rocks that you can barely get to. And we've analyzed these grains to, in a way that we can resolve out exactly when they erupted down to a couple thousand years of uncertainty. Like 2,000 years, right? Versus this was 60,000 years, okay? So here, again, we've got Huckleberry Ridge erupted about 2.08, okay? Snake River Butte, 2.14. This fixes this problem. You can't have something erupts before something else, right? We've got those ages reversed there. So we fix this problem. We make Snake Review older. Okay. And then these guys get a little bit older as well. So we've really improved the accuracy and the precision of um, these units. We've resolved the discrepancies between what's older and what's younger based on field relationships. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've reduced the duration of that cycle to about 200,000 years. And using the old ages um, on these units, that cycle was about 400,000 years. So the, the implication for that is that, you know, using the old ages, there was 400,000 years of volcanic activity. But with our new ages, there was only 200,000 years of volcanic activity, okay? Um, which also allows us to identify shorter periods of quiescence, okay? If you think about these older dates, okay, the pre-existing ones, it looks like there's a couple hundred thousand years between eruptions. Uh-uh. There was probably only like 40,000 years between eruptions, okay? So instead of building up a whole bunch of magma at one time, and then, um, and then erupting it over uh, um, more periodically, we're actually doing this more frequently than we thought. The uh, last thing, and I haven't really talked about this, is that 
Um, we were doing a little bit of paleomagnetism on these rocks as well, and so we've updated and confirmed that. You'll see in the um, stratigraphy chart over here, the polarity, um, black is for normal, white is for reverse, gray is for transition. Um, and so we're doing that on the side as well with some colleagues at the University of Utah. Okay, so here's first cycle. Let's now, um, I'm going to skip over this because we didn't really talk about this. Let's now skip over to um, the second cycle and think about those eruptions that happened prior to the Mesa Falls Tough. And again, there are five or six max flows, um, and I will just give you the answer now that there are actually six, not five. Um, so something had been mismapped in that. So we're going to zoom into the second cycle. Um, again, these are the uh, units that are right along that caldera rim um, just south of the reservoir. And look, I uh, planned for that. So this is right up here. <laughs> Here's the reservoir. Um, Bishop Mountain Flow, the Tuff of Lyle Spring, Moonshine, and um, the Green Canyon Flow. Okay. And here are our results. If I back up, and back up two, okay, we're looking at things that are 1.16, 1.19, 1.25, 1 so on and so forth. Um, and so again, 60,000 years of uncertainty on those. When we look at the new dates, the single crystal high precision geochronology argon dates, this is what we come up with. Okay. And you should say, oh, I don't remember seeing anything that was, you know, 1.45 on there. This is a period of volcanism that has previously been unconstrained. We knew that these eruptions existed, but we didn't have a very good control on their age. So no one has ever recognized volcanism at 1.45 million years ago in the Yellowstone volcanic field. This is important. Okay, so we um, propose that there is actually a separate um, volcanic system, the Lyle Spring system, um, that existed at about 1.45 million years ago. So unrelated to the super eruptions, but producing its own explosive stuff and its own uh, little um, effusive, smaller volume, not so super eruptions along with it. Okay. Um, and we've got some evidence for a shared chamber between the two, which I will show you with this diagram. So again, these are the results of our, um, of our uh, total fusion ages of the Tuff of Lyle Spring. And I've put on here, in blue, or periwinkle maybe, uh, the age of the Bishop Mountain Flow with our results. And when we take all of those grains out of the Tuff of Lyle Spring and analyze them, we see ages that represent the Bishop Mountain Flow preserved in that matrix. So this is telling us that there must have been some commingling between the two magma chambers prior to eruption. Okay. The other thing that I would point out okay, is that uh, the, the bars and the ages in black come from the pumice that Jamie was so painstakingly trying to remove. Okay. And all of the ages in gray come from the matrix. So if you want to get at the eruption age, the pumice is the frothy top on top of your, of your magma, that eruption age is coming from our pumice. And notice that all of our pumice ages cluster together. The matrix stuff has more of the uh, Bishop Mountain ages in it, and so we're picking up these things and redepositing Bishop Mountain um, grains along with the type of Lyle Spring. So this is new, right? We've never recognized this period of volcanism before, and we can now have evidence that we're sharing these magma chambers. Okay, um, the other half of, you can see an updated uh, spring system, the other half of the second volcanic cycle, um, right around um, the, the eruption of the Mesa Falls, Okay. We've got uh, two other flows, the Green Canyon and the Moonshine uh, Mountain Dome, that erupted basically within millennia of caldera formation. Okay. We cannot actually resolve out what came first, what came second. Okay. 
in this case. They erupted so close together in time that even with our high precision dating, we can't figure out which was first and which was second. Okay, so called air forming and small volume, not so super eruptions, likely occur within millennia of each other. Um, and, and in this case, remember I mentioned that some of these have biotite in them, they are compositionally different, and so therefore they are not likely sharing chambers. Which is interesting, because the, you would think that something with a super eruption would be sharing chambers with the not so super eruption. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. Okay, so our implications for this. Take you back to this slide with our stratigraphy here. Okay. And again, we're thinking about the case of magnetism. Case of magnetism and volcanism over two million years. Have we done it? Did we figure it out? Well, I think the question that we need to ask is how do we define a cycle? And can we actually put some age constraints on those cycles? Okay. Our cycle is getting longer. The lava creek tuff okay, erupted about uh, 640,000 years ago. Our most recent eruption was 74,000 years ago. Is this all part of the same cycle? Is it something start of a new cycle, right? like we saw with the tuff of Lyle spring system? Are the cycles getting longer? Is there actually a period to say? I don't know. These are unanswered questions for us. Okay. Uh, the next thing we want to do is determine magma flux rates. So these small, frequent magmatic eruptions or injections versus these super eruptions. Well, it looks like what we see with the Tuff of Lyle Spring and Bishop Mountain Flow is that you can have smaller periods of magnetism that inject into the crust that never erupt. And then how long does it take us to actually accumulate enough magma so that we're going to um, produce a super eruption versus a not so super eruption? This is pretty difficult, right? Because we want to get a really good handle on the accumulation of magma so that we can produce the next super eruption, right? But how long does it actually take to accumulate that much magma? And this is something that I'll talk about tomorrow um, in the Zircon work that we're doing. Proxy for the growth of the continental crust. This was a new one um, to me um, that I really kind of latched onto and, and really want to run with it. Um, but we're looking at magmatic injections um, like within the Tuffle Bottle Spring, okay? And so this is a, um, a figure designed by Mark Stelton um, from his 2017 paper where he's showing um, kind of the magma chamber for the Mesa Falls Tuff through here, and then these um, smaller magmas that are uh, being extracted from that and erupting along the caldera rim. So are we, or did we, uh, make magma and build crust in the same way in the Archean when we were really starting to put together continents like we see here um, at Yellowstone? I don't have an answer to that. Um, that's something that is uh, just starting to come to me the terms of things that I want to do the next 30 years. Okay. Um, so tomorrow um, I'll talk about petrochronology, um, which is the, zoo, the zircon work that um, we've been doing on the same set of rocks. Um, and tomorrow I'm mostly going to talk about Mesa Falls Tuff um, and the results that we see from Mesa Falls Tuff for periodicity of magmatic injections into the crust. Um, and uh, these are zircon grains from that. They are um, really intricate um, and give us a really nice idea of what the magmas are doing prior to eruption. Um, so if you are able to make it tomorrow, we're going to use some chemistry to look at how magma, magma systems change prior to eruption. Okay. And it's this new word, petrochronology, which is kind of fun. And with that, um, I want to just give um, thanks to my collaborators, Mark Schmitz, Jim Crowley, Brian Jika, and Pete Libert at the University of Utah, um, as well as to our students at Westminster College. Um, couldn't have done this without them. If you've not been to Mesa Falls, you should go, because it's beautiful. Um, and then here is a photograph of 
uh, the Mesa Falls Tough, which I have with me. And it looks like we have time for um, some questions. I'd love to be able to show you the Tough of Lyle Spring, um, to show you some of the Huckleberry Ridge Tough and um, the Mesa Falls Tough, the promises that we've collected um, from Ashton. So with that, I want to thank you. And um, yeah, any questions? basic way um, kind of outline why this could point to new continental crest like what would be the process or yeah. but in a basic way so so the question is how does this help us uh, determine how continental crust is, is is growing so we think of uh, what we see within the Yellowstone system is that it will be pulses of magma that never erupt and I'm gonna just back up to uh, the Lyle Springs results up here, this guy. So th in blue, we have the Bishop Mountain Flow um, eruption, but what we don't see at the surface are these older populations of grains. And so my interpretation of that is that we've made magma and crystallized these grains, but never erupted them until we erupted the Tuffle Bio Spring and it picked it back up. So we've got these pulses of magma that are coming in that are crystallizing. And could this be the same way that we built the crust, bring in some magma, never erupt it, and just crystallize it um, within the crust itself? Does that, does that? Yeah, I mean, is that related to the, um, the oceanic ridges and how that crust is made? Um, no, it would be related more to how we build uh, crust at subduction zones. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Good analogy. What else? We all want to look at rocks, right? <laughs> John. Tiffany, um, you know, some of these uh, events are only a couple thousand years apart. Um, I think in this one instance here, you had almost a uh, half a million years. Um, so a couple yeah. of questions, I guess. One is, do you think there's um, missing um, evidence, data flows? And uh, is that long of a period like that? Do you see any evidence for that and some of the other uh, in-between cycles, if there are data, for instance? Um, so the first question, is there a missing record? Most certainly, okay. Um, we have made so many caldera forming eruptions um, from the start, right, from the Snake River Butte flow, that it is very likely that we are missing some of the record, okay. Um, we blasted these things out later. Um, so yeah, are we missing things? Most likely. Um, the second question reminds me, well, there's almost half a million the gap. years. Oh yeah, do we see do we see the same gap other in other places? Uh, one well, comparable that long because you know we around here we well I mean some people realize the most recent eruption was seventy plus thousand years ago. You no, know, so is it done? Um, right. Um, so you'll see, is it done? No. Um, that's another one I could be starting about. Um, so here, yeah, you see about 150,000 years between the Lyle Spring system and the Mesa Falls system. Um, you see that same kind of duration of quiescence um, after the Mesa Falls as well. Uh, so um, Ben Ellis, uh, who's at UT <coughs> Zurich, he does a lot of work on the post-Mesa Falls stuff um, and sees these long periods of inactivity as well. So again, getting back to that, is there cyclicity in this? Well, I don't really know, right? Because you have to be able to consider the periods of non-activity as much as you consider the periods of activity. Yes, sir. When you uh, go north from Ashton and climb up that, you know, there's the Huckleberry Ridge top and then there's the Mesa Falls, but in between, there's something that looks like the pumice. 
Yeah. It's on the left side. Yep. And if you drive in that subdivision, there's big chunks of Now, is that part of the caldera eruption, or is that one of these small... No, that is the Mesa Falls Tough. Yep. And, um, and, and those pumices are Mesa Falls Tough pumices. Did they come out before the tough? No. The so, first stage of the pumice, um, if you think about a magma chamber, the top part of the magma chamber is where you're going to find the really frothy part. It's like the opening your soda bottle, you know, you get the, the carbon dioxide um, that comes to the top. And so when you chill that top frothy part of your magma, that's what makes pumice. The tough is the accumulation of the ash and the pumice and all other things that then get compressed and welded together. So in some of the Lyle Springs um, samples that I brought today, you can see pumice that's in there, um, but it's within this matrix. And same with the Mesa Falls tough. We'll look at some pumice. Don't go far. Mm -hmm. And you had a question as well. Yeah, yeah. when they originally uh, figured out that um, there were different eruptions, and uh, when they saw rocks from different eruptions, um, how did they tell by looking at the rock that it was a different eruption? Yeah, um, a big part of that is um, the mineral assemblage. So if you see the biotite versus no biotite, I think that's a really big clue, especially back in um, Warren Hamilton in the 1960s made one of the first maps out here. Um, and so he was using a lot of the mineralogy. Um, also, if you just go to Google Earth, um, and look at some of the features. You can see some of the, um, which way do I want to go? Maybe this way. So in Google Earth, you can see some of the, here is a Little Buttes, I believe it's called. You can see some of these other little buttes, uh, domes, little smaller eruptions as well. So with um, satellite technology, we're actually being able to map um, not even on the ground anymore. Yeah. And then they'll do chemical analyses. Um, you can crush the rocks in it to um, a, a chemistry lab, and they'll give you the percent of magnesium, the percent of silicon, the percent of all of the elements that you can particularly want. Um, and that's another way that you can correlate which units are the same. Yes? I think you said that the silicon. Uh, something oxide is more explosive, and why is that? Um, so these things can also hold a lot of water in them as well. Um, water is, uh, and carbon dioxide, um, so these things will get dissolved within the magma. Um, and like that soda bottle analogy, as you release the pressure on it, it's going to make it more explosive. And once you start releasing the pressure, right, you can then um, make uh, allow more carbon dioxide to come out of the solution and it kind of like snowballs in that way. Yeah. She was also asking, I think, about the, the effect of the amount of silica. Oh, with the amount of silica, so yeah. So with viscosity. Um, a lot of these domes are very viscous, they're sticky, um, and they are also high silica. Um, the explosiveness comes from um, the amount of carbon dioxide that those high silica magmas can hold. So when you have uh, like basalt magmas, um, which are typically very low in silica, about 40%, 45%, they can't hold as much dissolved um, carbon dioxide. So like Kilauea today. Kilauea today uh, is not holding a whole lot of um, carbon dioxide. And you might see some videos of explosive eruptions just blasting stuff out of there, but it, it, it is not comparable in size to what these things are. Yes, ma'am. So sorry to sorry, I'm sorry. They're not the volcanoes, but you were talking about some of the chambers are the same as this. The big one. Yes. The are these chambers deeper or more shallow so that they aren't continuous? Or I, I don't really understand. Yeah. Um, you might repeat that. I'm not sure everybody needs that. Sure. So she's asking um, if the chambers are connected. Um, the, the not so super and the super eruption chambers are connected. Are they at various depths, um, or are they all at the same depth? Is that to interpret that right? Um, and I don't necessarily have a question or an answer for that. It looks like um, chemically, um, and, and I'll talk about this tomorrow with the zircon. Chemically, the super eruptions 
look more primitive. So they haven't seen a whole lot of um, chemical evolution of that magma chamber. It looks like a fresh magma chamber. Whereas these um, younger, or not younger, these smaller eruptions seem to have been like kind of sitting there a little bit longer and were able to evolve their chemistry a little bit more. As far as depth, that is not something I can answer. I think uh, um, there's a lot of geophysical work that's being done um, at Yellowstone around Old Faithful. One of my friends is a seismologist who goes and puts up seismometers around Old Faithful every year. Um, and so there's looking at trying to image the depth of those different magma chambers um, below present day Yellowstone. But as far as these, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. Do the multiple smaller eruptions sort of uh, release pressure off of the possibility of a super, or does it actually add to it? Yeah, so the, the follow up to that was do the eruptions out of the smaller. Um, the smaller eruptions help to release the pressure and then cause the super eruption. And this is a great question, and that it may be the case, especially with um, the Green Canyon flow right here. So the Green Canyon flow, remember, is, uh, so this is the one up here in green, um, is uh, the same age as Mesa Falls Tough, and it's faulted down into the caldera. And so because of this, we know that it had to be there before it could be faulted down. Um, so it's a really good indicator that, that this guy erupted before the caldera. And um, the way that calderas form is you'll start these smaller um, eruptions right around the ring of the caldera. So it could be that the Green Canyon flow was that initial release of pressure that then allowed the rest of it to go. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir? Um, technically, can you tell us how you determine the argon isotope ratios? And then how you extract the from that? Yes. Um, so what we do is we extract the cyanidine um, from the grain and we are radiated um, to convert the potassium into an artificial isotope of argon. And then in the mass spectrometer, we will have um, five different collectors. Um, and so we are detecting five different isotopes of the argon, including the artificial one. And that artificial one then acts as a proxy for the amount of potassium. And so our ages are this ratio of, um, of the, the argon that's produced through radioactive decay and the, ratio, and the uh, artificial isotope that we have made, which is our proxy for the potassium. And so we know the decay rate from potassium to argon, and so we can back out the age using this artificial isotope of argon. So we're making Argon, right? We're making, yeah, through, through this is why we irradiate it, um, is to convert that potassium and argon. By, by irradiating, do you say by neutron bombardment? Neutron bombardment, yep. Yep, exactly. And did I see you also had a question? I was going to say, uh, if these things are cyclical, what do we do? I don't know. Okay, so let me, let me also say, with all of these cycles, something that I haven't talked about, I'm talking about the rhyolites and the explosive things, but what I haven't talked about is that with, um, between all of these cycles, there are also a bunch of assaults. So we erupt out all of these rhyolites, and then we erupt basalt. Well, we haven't seen the basalt yet after Lava Creek. So, it, you know, if these cycles are the same, right, and that's a big if, right, we would expect to see Assault coming up next. Yeah. So it could be looking like Hawaii in our backyards. That'd be a lot better than uh, yeah. 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 Huckleberry Ridge Tough. Yeah. So we'd like to leave some time for people that want to see yeah. the rocks. Perfect. So any other burning questions here? Any last questions? Burning, huh? All right, um, let's give Tiffany one more big hand. And just a quick reminder, she's speaking again tomorrow at the Senior Center at lunchtime. Arrive around 12 o'clock, you can get your ticket and have a hot lunch, which is quite good, I've had them before. And, um, and hear Tiffany talk about the zircons of Yellowstone. So.
should be excellent again. And I would like to, um, so it turns out that Mike Schur is hiking somewhere in the middle of the Brooks Range in Alaska. So um, I get to do the closing tonight. <laughs> so Tiffany, thank you. Thank you again. And here's a little gift thank you. from the geologist of Jackson Hole. So thank you very much. Thank you.